Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. First order business, I'm gonna say thank you so much to the new subscribers and to those who have stuck around from the beginning. It's much appreciated. I wanna give a caveat for today's video. This video is just my opinion um, formed by the information that's presented in interviews by the parties, by the witnesses, information that was released from the court case files, this documentary series, and also the court of public opinion because I'm a little older and I remember this case from when it first broke back in the 90s. Viewers are always encouraged in all my videos to form their own opinions and I'm going to leave my comment section open like I usually do. Just note that if you're coming here because you searched the topic and you aren't familiar with my videos, I, I don't have Wild Wild West in my comment section, so if it all of a sudden appears to have really um, hateful language and Wild Wild West comments, I'll take note that a PR machine might be involved because usually everybody's pretty classy and even-handed in the comment section. So having said all that, this video is a full spoiler review of the HBO Max series Alan V. Farrow. It's a four episode documentary wherein Dylan Farrow finally has her full and complete say on the matter of her alleged molestation by Woody Allen. And we're going to tread really lightly on that M word. We're going to call it S.A. You know what that stands for. Okay, so I'm going to be gentle with it because YouTube is particular about the things we can talk about, which is odd because the world is filled with all kinds of stuff that you can talk about ad nauseum, but things that are really important sometimes are censored. So anyway, I wanna say this documentary, it's beautifully and artfully filmed. I wanna take note, the drone scenes over Central Park in New York, um, the drone scenes over Mia's Frog Hollow estate in Connecticut, it's beautiful. It's mixed with first person interviews, rich home video footage. Nope, no surprise, there's a lot of home video footage as Mia was the girlfriend of a director and an actress herself. There's also secretly taped audio recordings that are played and Dylan Farrow states that the public has been told lies and obfuscation for the past 20 years and she wants to have her say. So we're given the backstory of actress Mia Farrow and writer-director Woody Allen and the documentary revisits the history of the adults in order to better explain all the stakes that are involved in the allegations Dylan makes against her adopted father, Woody. It's important to understand the context. As Dylan is shown in the right, right in the beginning, looking at a strategically cropped snapshot from a family album that Mia has created, she opines, we do what we have to do. And there's something about that that resonates throughout this whole entire documentary. We do what we have to do. The documentary shows Dylan grappling with both her childhood and adult feelings. And she talks about all the guilt that she let herself down by crumbling under pressure and by not pushing the allegations further by testifying in court when she had the opportunity. It's apparent that none of the Pharaoh Allen children lack for material comforts while growing up. We're shown a gaggle of children going on trips in private jets, in limos, romping in their idyllic home in Connecticut, living essentially in Manhattan. Stories of a left behind teddy bear being flown to another, you know, first class in order to comfort Dylan. It's, it's a comfortable a material lifestyle. However, increasingly, the home movies seem to show Dylan as a child becoming more withdrawn as the years go by. And Dylan Farrow has been adopted by Mia Farrow. So genetically, we're going to talk genetics because genetics in a way are brought up in, in a certain defensive motion later on. So that's, that's why we talk about genetics. Usually to me, an adopted child is considered a child. All right? It's considered a child. You don't really have to play Oh, you know, this is my bio kid and that's an adopted kid. You adopted the kid, the kid's a child, right? But we're going to have to play the genetic game, so we will. Genetically, she's neither the biological child of Woody or Mia. So keep this in mind for later. Woody Allen, unlike his relationship with the other children, both adopted and biological, becomes extremely attached to Dylan. This is essentially not, I don't believe it's argued, that he's extremely attached to Dylan. Mia's interviewed in this documentary 
and she says she feels guilt for allowing Woody Allen to come into this family, for bringing Woody Allen into this family. And Woody Allen, meanwhile, is shown as the lovable, nebbish mensch character. Much screen time is given over to the legend of Woody Allen. I mean, we don't scrimp on that in this documentary. You know, the guy, this menschy character that writes great female parts into his movies. He, you know, he's shown as being relatable, essentially, and worshipped and you could even say he's given a tongue bath quite a few times. The documentary also uses Woody Allen's 2020 autobiography called Apropos of Nothing in order to narrate his part in this story, which actually is kind of clever. And to me, it works in putting forth his side because it, it's, it's a recent uh, audio of his autobiography. And so to me, it works, but keep an eye out for a lawsuit regarding this, okay? That is how the documentary puts forth his version because allegedly he declined to participate in the documentary. He didn't give a statement, so hey, they used his own words. So we're given Mia's backstory. She comes from a large family and they were in the business. Her dad was a director, her mom was an actress, and Mia, we come to find out, had a childhood bout with polio. And that is what spurs her on to try to help children. That is the reason why she feels compelled to adopt and to try to help children because she said that she saw other children become paralyzed and some died and she fought very hard to recover from the polio and she wanted to spend the rest of her life trying to make a difference in this way. Woody and Mia meet in 1979 and at this point she's had three biological sons with her second husband, Andre Previn, and her first husband was Frank Sinatra. Mia and Andre Previn, they adopt three children. They adopt Lark Previn, Daisy Previn, and Suni Previn. So she has three boys' bios and three adoptions with Andre Previn. And Suni, and by the way, it's E, not Yi, by the way. Apparently that is the proper way to pronounce it and a lot of folks do a lot of research but then they don't properly pronounce her name. It's Suni. So Suni was adopted from Korea as an older child and no one was even sure of her age initially and they had to use her wrist to determine. I guess you could look at a child's wrist and sort of determine the age. And she was thought to be around five years old when she was adopted. As Suni had been abandoned by her own mother, she had a real difficult time bonding with Mia. Both of them, in retrospect, have said this, that Mia said that she didn't even want to leave Suni when she would go and do one of the movies. She would take Suni with her because she knew, knew that Suni had been abandoned in her life and didn't want to do that until they were bonded. And then I think Suni has also said, in retrospect, that she did not feel Mia was very maternal with her. Andre Previn ends up falling in love with Mia's best friend. And they're, after this initial upset in their relationship, they remain friends. She remains friends with Frank Sinatra as well. So keep this in mind. In life, you know this, guys. People have histories. And you can have bad relationships, and you can have good relationships, you can have relationships that just don't work and people move on. But if you have someone that can always stay friends with their ex, okay? And then someone that falls out with all their family members and you know what I mean? You can look kind of at their character that way, right? Do they burn bridges? If you look at Mia, she doesn't seem to have problems with people. So just, just note that, okay? It's just something to factor in. She remains friends with her second husband. She remains friends with Frank Sinatra. She didn't have any kids with him, allegedly. So after her relationship with Andre, Previn is over. Mia goes on to adopt Moses all by herself. So by the time she meets Woody Allen in 1979, she has a total of seven children. And she had only had Suni about two years at this point. So also factor that in. Because of her brood of seven kids, Mia said that she knew it would be a challenge to find another husband or another boyfriend because a lot of men or women don't necessarily want to take that on. That's, that's a responsibility. And Woody told, told Mia that he had zero interest in kids. 
zero. I'm going to be really fair in this documentary, as fair as I can be. It's just my opinion, guys. But in my opinion, okay, this should have been a red flag for Mia. Not to even bother dating Woody Allen. I'm not blaming a victim here, all right? It's just my hot take on it. And maybe we can take the red flags instead of like a blame, put it like, hey, this is a cautionary thing. Like, maybe you don't want to, this isn't the one. Move on. Because we always want to like learn something from something, not just be sitting there salaciously listening. Like, what can we learn? Well, I think we could learn that if someone <laughs> tells you they really don't have an interest in kids, and you have seven of them, maybe they're not the partner for you. They're not the life partner for you. When Woody Allen meets Mia Farrow, he has two Oscars and he's hot off the success of his 1979 film, Manhattan. And this film explores the age differences between an older man and a 17 year old girl, a high school girl. Then this documentary interviews Christina Engelhart and she tells how she was later told that she was the muse for Manhattan. She asks Woody, was I the muse? Because this sounds like our relationship. And he says, yes, allegedly. So she says that she had a secret relationship with the older Woody when she was 17, that she met him when she was 16, and they remained intimate until she was 23. And she recounts how this relationship had taken a toll on her and that she wouldn't let her children do date an older man, be hanging around with older men. That's what she says. Woody Allen crafted numerous movies where this power dynamic is explored, this older man, younger woman dynamic ex is explored. And he would write, direct, produce, and star in many of the movies exploring this exact same power dynamic. So back to Mia and Woody. Woody lives across the park from her. They both have their own pads, you know, and Mia's got her brood of seven. And over time, Woody Allen warms to Mia's children. And he has them stay at his New York apartment on weekends when Mia's seeing him. And he takes them on overseas trips. And he takes them to basketball games. And he attends some of their graduations and so on. And in the interviews, Mia's children, like say Fletcher Previn, who actually has a father, Andre Previn, says that, you know, yeah, we saw him as a father, I saw him as a father figure. Not some random boyfriend, a father figure. He was there at Mia's home almost every single morning. But note, the people that want to say that Woody was not a father figure to Suni, okay, their example, their excuse, their their evidence for that is that he didn't sleep over at Mia's house. So therefore, you know, he was just some random boyfriend. You know, he's just random. He's there. She's not, he's not a father figure. He's random. Well, okay. Let, let's stop and think about this. In my opinion, the, if you read, I think it's in her biography, she talks about how neurotic he was. Oh, are we shocked? Because he writes his movies about being neurotic. That he was so neurotic about the way he showered, like the drain had to be in the exact right spot. And like she even created a shower at one of her houses for him and he didn't like it because the drain was in the wrong spot. So he would get really neurotic and he liked his spot. He liked his things the way they were. So he would go home to sleep there and take his showers there. Does that mean he's not a father figure because he, he goes off to a bolt hole at night? If you're gonna make an, if you're gonna form an opinion about something, and you wanna, and you're dug in a trench about a team, you're gonna use any excuse you want to to buttress your opinions. That that's what I think. And here is where that statement that Dylan makes: "We do what we have to do to survive." Essentially, I think that's important. I think people in life choose the facts and the the evidence and the examples they want to see to form their opinions and to in order to do what they want to do. Woody goes on to cast Mia Farrow in many of his films. Mia states that she felt very subservient to Woody and that she was frightened that she'd be unable to live up to his exacting acting expectations and that she tries to like justify being cast in, you know, in his films. So she recounts that she, he would remind her how lucky she was to work with him. You know, you know, essentially she says, I was worried I was getting older and you know, he always like, let her know how lucky she was and 
other, you know, that maybe he didn't tell her how much he thought her, you know, how good she was. And Mia also shared an agent with Woody over time. So they were very enmeshed in their working relationship. Throughout the time they were together, over a decade, Woody was told that he was welcome to participate in any way in the rearing of Mia's children. And over time, she wanted to adopt again. And Woody said that he might be interested, he might be quote unquote kindly disposed in a little blonde girl. All right, that's what Mia alleges he said. So what does Mia do? She adopts a little blonde girl, Dylan, on July 11th, 1985. So let's talk about opportunities for change. Let's talk about red flags, okay? Not blaming anybody, just talking about how we can use things as a cautionary tale, right? Why didn't Mia ask herself why Woody would be predisposed to a little blonde girl? In my opinion, it can't be healthy to play favorites in any family dynamic, much less a blended family dynamic. So if you want to raise a human being, fine. Raise a human being. Some people are partial to girls versus boys fine. I think most people realize whatever they're going to get, they get and they're happy with it if it's healthy. You know what I'm saying? But if you want a little blonde girl that you'd be disposed to that, you know, that to me, why the specificity there? Why the specificity? That sits wrong with me. This then recount seeing Woody's intensity with baby Dylan. Woody's own words back up this intensity of feeling. Over time, Mia then becomes pregnant, naturally pregnant. Okay, so she wanted to be pregnant. She didn't get pregnant. They adopt, and then, of course, you know how it is. The pressure's off. She becomes pregnant with, let's call him Satchel Ronan. The reason I'm going to call him Satchel Ronan is because he was named Satchel, but he now goes by Ronan. So let's just call him Satchel Ronan and make it easy. So Woody had hoped for a girl, but he got Satchel Ronan, okay, who was born in 1987. And Mia, of course, naturally focuses on the newborn, Satchel Ronan, and Woody focuses on Dylan. And Dylan alleges that Woody told her around this time that Mia was just too busy for her. I mean, Mia had the newborn, and so Woody kind of honed in and, and filled in. And for those who claim that Woody Allen was simply Mia's boyfriend, they, you don't need to look any farther than these home movies. Okay, sit there and watch through the four episodes, all the little home movies. Watch those and watch the body language between the children, all right? That's a father figure. That's not just a boyfriend. I don't care where Woody laid his head at night. I don't care if he slept in his own bed across the park, all right? Or whether he showered in his own shower across the park. If you act like a father, if you have a baby with her, meaning Satchel Ronan, if you adopt her unfathered children, you're a father figure to the family. That's how that works. You know, whether you want to label it something else to, to make it, to make you you're comfortable, you, you, we do what we have to do, right? And one could argue that grooming behaviors are also now being described. We hear from non-family, many different folks, about Woody's alleged interest in Dylan his alleged obsessive her, his following of her, hovering over her, and how Dylan begins hiding from him. She recounts being taken away from the other children by her father. You know, he, like, he just wanted alone time. And witnesses say that Dylan goes from being an outgoing and bubbly child to being quite withdrawn. Again, let's talk about the red flags. This isn't blaming victims. It's just saying, how can we use this as a cautionary tale? Why is a child at age mm, five becoming withdrawn all of a sudden? What has changed in the environment that's making them do that? Why is this child being put in therapy? March of 1991, Dylan begins therapy for being shy, for being withdrawn, and being fearful. So this is before SUNY. This is before Dylan's allegation. This is in allegedly in the record. Okay, so you can't argue against that, can you? She allegedly tells her therapist in the notes that is found, that is revealed by this documentary, that she had a secret. But Mia was never told that Dylan told her therapist she had a secret. The witnesses in this documentary, they then speak out about seeing firsthand 
Woody seemingly inappropriate behaviors with Dylan, Mia's sister, and a girlfriend. They allegedly see what they deem to be inappropriate behaviors. One example is given. The, the kids are nude and they're out in the sun and sunscreen's being applied and Woody takes it upon himself to put sunscreen on Dylan and he swipes up between her buttocks, you know, with his finger and that allegedly Mia sees this and grabs the sunscreen, sunscreen from him and, you know, in an irritated manner and people saw this and Mia tells also of seeing Woody pop Dylan on the hand on a different occasion and when she asked, well, why did you hit her hand, that Woody allegedly said that Dylan tried to grab his private part. And when we hear also the thing that sets me off to being like the red flags are just waving is the thumb sucking. Now you might say, oh, kids suck, suck their own thumbs. Yeah, they, they some of them do. But how many people use their own thumb and say, here, suck my thumb. And then uh, to me, that is, that got me, that got me. We hear about the thumb sucking and Woody allegedly allowed directed Dylan and how to suck his thumb and she says how to uh, put her tongue how to how do I say this how did he directed her on how to use her tongue on his finger in her mouth and uh, that sent me and allegedly Woody said quote unquote when he was I wouldn't say caught doing it. I, th I don't think it was even hidden that much that this happened, that this was a, a practice. I don't know. He would say this helps her, this calms her down. Priscilla is one person that he told this to. That was one of the Previn boys' girlfriends that was always at the at the house. And Woody said, ah, this, this helps her, this calms her down to suck my thumb. But Dylan explains that he directed her to suck his thumb and how to use her, t how to use her tongue on his thumb. And when Mia, of course, expressed concerns about all this stuff, she was called crazy, allegedly. She says, he says, I honestly think you need help for her, I wouldn't even say accusations, for her suggestion that this didn't look good. And in my opinion, that's gaslighting, right? So Mia says that during this time period, a famous psychiatrist, Dr. Ethel Person, calls her up and says that she saw something in the way that Woody greeted Dylan that she found disturbing or upset her or was concerning. And so Woody's therapist, he already is in therapy, and he allegedly starts addressing these issues of his interactions with Dylan. The therapist, another therapist apparently was recommended by Dr. Person, and that therapist allegedly tells Mia that Woody's behavior could be viewed as um, inappropriate, but it wasn't sexual, but it needed to be addressed. And so he was addressing those issues. And since he was in therapy, Mia said that she allowed, on December 17th, 1991, Woody Allen to adopt, to formally adopt Dylan and Moses. So these are the two children that Mia had at that point with no named father, because everybody else was under Andre Previn. And Moses was the one that she adopted between the relationships. So the two that didn't have named fathers were those two when he adopted those two. He was already the named father of Satchel Ronan because that was a bio kid. So she, knowing that, that he was in therapy for these behaviors that were, could be viewed as inappropriate by a normal person, but were not sexual, but need to be worked on, but she still allowed that adoption to go through, is something, a teachable moment. It, yeah, that's maybe not the best idea in the world, right? Meanwhile, Woody is interacting more with Suni, and Mia is always encouraging him to do things with the other children, take him to basketball games and the like. And he has said, I think it was in his autobiography, I was enjoying her company more than I should have. So meanwhile, Woody allows Suni to see a screening of the seventh seal and he, he kisses her. He kisses his baby mama's adopted daughter. 
and she allegedly says to him, I wonder when you are going to make a move. And he replied, paraphrase, I'm paraphrasing this. What do you mean, make my move? Give me a break. I'm in some kind of relationship with your mother. Okay? Like he's the, like she's the aggressor, right? And he's this lovable character that's like, what do you mean, make my move? Oh. Very, very like the movie Manhattan. You know, he's got a script. <laughs> oh, gosh. So Alan states in his autobiography, again, written in 2020, essentially that he thought that he and Suni could have their little fling and keep it secret. And it would be a nice experience. And that Suni would later go on to have a more conventional relationship. <sighs> All right. So let's talk about this. Woody Allen is willing, as a human, as a person, as a man, to drop an atom bomb in a blended family in order to enjoy what he deemed at that moment to be a fling? On its face to me, that statement alone is extremely concerning. That you would put your needs, your wants and desires of the moment over over the family's sanity, the family's peace, over something that just would be a fling? What, what kind of person would do that? Just, just, let's say it's a fairy tale. Let's say all this up, but what kind of person would do that? I, I just can't. I, my mind is, is blown. He comments, this is what Woody comments, and I'm going to paraphrase this so I might get a word or two wrong, but this is from his autobiography. Here's a sharp, classy lady full of latent potential, just waiting to ripen superbly. If only someone would give her some love. And, and I've condensed that. Waiting to ripen superbly? Really? Okay. So she needs like someone like his attention in order to ripen superbly. Are you kidding me? Honestly, in my opinion, his own words damn him. You don't need anything else. His own words damn him in this issue. There's a debate between the parties whether Woody began a relationship with Suni during her senior year in high school or whether it was in her first year of college. Okay, so I'll be seemingly making it whether it's a, a legal and a moral dilemma versus just a moral dilemma. So I think it was probably just a moral dilemma because I think due to her, them being unsure of her age initially, she probably was legally in her teens, okay? So in 19, 20, 21, that was probably accurate. But that is, boy, that's a slippery slope, isn't it? Woody and Suni insist the relationship began during her first year of college. That's their assertion. The documentary tells how the staff, the like say the doorman and the manager at Woody's apartment later admitted and uh, said they saw Suni coming and going and she was in her high school uniform. That That's allegedly what had been said at some point, I don't know. And then apparently a maid had told Mia later that she had found semen stained sheets and condoms in the wastebasket. Of course that wouldn't be for Mia, so after Suni's visits at, with, with Woody while she was in high school. That's what she was told, you know, take that for what it's worth. And also note that the high school that she went to, Marymount, was right down the street, right near Woody's apartment. There's debate over when it, the, the relationship truly kicked off. You know, was it when he was showing her the seventh seal and this in the way he tells it? Which is enough, like I said, that's enough. I don't need to hear anything else, but there might, it might even be more. I just want to go off on a tangent. I'm trying to keep myself focused, but if, you know, when this comes to light, you, to me, it's understandable to go and do revisionist history in your mind and be like, when did this happen? What did that mean when that happened? And that, did that mean this and that? You know, it's going to make you kind of nutty, you know, to try to figure out what, who, what, when, where, why, and how, right? So on January 13th, 1992, Mia goes over to Woody's apartment. I think she said that maybe Satchel had left a, a coat or something, Satchel Ronan. And she ends up discovering these, what did she call, raunchy Polaroids of her adopted daughter, Suni, 
on the mantelpiece. So she wasn't snooping or anything. And I think if I remember correctly, I don't think it's brought up in the documentary. I think there was something that involved like a phone call that even got her closer to the mantelpiece. So it's like, it's almost, part of me was like, did something in him want, or, or maybe, I don't know who left the photos there. I don't know if Suni left them there or if Woody left them there. But it's almost like, did something subconsciously want those photos found? Was there something subconsciously that the person that left those there did it because allegedly he was really neurotic and anal and everything had its place and for them to be found there it was she it's unusual so anyway mia sees these photos on the mantelpiece realizes it's her daughter and suni at this point is in her first year of college so mia takes the photos they're polaroids too if you don't know what a polaroid is it's you didn't have to have them developed. Nobody else had to go and develop the photos for you because if it's a raunchy photo, usually you didn't you didn't take them to the to the some anonymous person to develop them. And also, if it was underage, you wouldn't you would get arrested. So, the Polaroids are like a photo you could take right there, and you just shook it and it developed. Now they're not very good photos, but that's what he used. And you also got to wonder why why did you use a Polaroid? Is it because they were raunchy? And anyway. Because he was a director, he had all, the, I'm sure he had all the cameras in the world to use, really high quality, nice cameras, but he uses a Polaroid. Just saying. So Mia finds the photo, she confronts both Woody and Suni. So she goes home and locks her door, by the way. But see, Woody's got the key to her apartment because, you know, because he's just some random boyfriend, right? Mia blames this whole debacle on Woody as Suni is her daughter and essentially her child. She doesn't, she says that she is blaming this on Woody, but make no mistake, Mia was very ang angry at Suni and even slaps at her at one point when she later finds her talking to Woody even after this turmoil has happened. And, and I gotta say, it's really regrettable that Mia struck Suni. Like you really should never put your hands on someone. Having said that, I understand an angry reaction in this kind of situation where you're just freaking completely out. But she apologized for hitting her, but she did slap her. She did slap her for what she did. And it's like these people don't understand right from wrong. And this is just my takeaway of it. It's just, it's a mess, coated in a mess, shellacked in a mess, and stuffed with a mess. So allegedly, when confronted, Woody claims, in terms both the love Suni and then sometimes he turns around and says, no, 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 I didn't. I just thought that would make it sound better. I love you, Mia. And we're also hearing these audio recordings that were secretly taped. So a little bit more of the situation about the different party stances at different points in this tale are revealed. It, neither party looked great, by the way. So allegedly he goes back and forth in his protests, his protestations about which one he loves and... He allegedly at one point asks Mia to burn the photos, but Mia does not burn them. She puts them in a safe. But since the family is now in turmoil, Mia, per the therapist advice, is told to tell the younger children because they're already hearing it. Because the family is literally like, like I said, a bomb is dropped into the family and there's fallout falling on all the members. And it's just nuclear and nasty and the different children are hearing things and so She's instructed on exactly what to tell the younger children about all this drama that's going on in the house. So two weeks later, Suni heads back to college. And allegedly, Woody Allen tries to get back with Mia. And there's a secretly recorded calls. There's plenty of these from the summer of 1992. And they have Woody saying the following. I should not have drifted into a relationship with Suni. And Mia questions, are you in love with me or are you in love with Suni? And Woody replies, we have a way to go to define it, meaning his relationship with Mia. And then it's like, to do our best to put this all behind us. And Mia continues to work for Woody, okay? So it's almost like, I don't know if she was almost willing to patch it up with him if he had just picked a side. At this point, we've gone past the point where we say, what can we learn from this? I don't think we'd be in this 
predicament, but you definitely don't want to continue a relationship with this man, in my opinion. And maybe vice versa, you know? If it's that messy that, that she had to get away from Mia or whatever, you need to cut that. Because this, this is messy to, to this structure, to the nuclear structure that's going on with this blended family. Mia says that she spoke with Suni seemingly at Woody's. Okay, so she's talking to Woody allegedly and Suni's at that house and that they were talking about Suni's age, probably trying to pin her down as to when she started this and that Suni lied to Mia about her age and Mia knew it was a lie. Like it was like something that was like a fact. And so she knew that Woody, she's like, why would Woody, Woody must be taping me, which he was. So she starts taping him back. So they're both taping each other's conversation. So at different points, they're letting the other one run off at the mouth because they know they're taping it. It's crazy. You hear on these tapes, Woody telling Mia, of course I'm not taping this call. I don't know how to do this. Of course I'm not, you, you know. And you're sitting here thinking, Mia Farrow, that he's a freaking director. Of course he knows how to tape a phone call. Are you kidding me? Of course he, he's taping you. He said he wasn't, which he was, because we're listening to the tapes. We're listening to his side of the tapes, because you hear the phone breaking in and he's answering other calls. Those are his side of the, of the, the tape. He was taping her, okay? And, uh, of course, these make it into the court record. She starts taping him back, because she realizes by what he's saying that, that obviously he's, it's some kind of a facade. She starts taping him back. And for her to even think that a director, you know, him trying that number law, I will, of course I wouldn't know how to do that. Well, you're a director. Of course you would know how to do that. Of course you know how to tape a phone call. I mean, are you kidding me? Acting like he doesn't know electronics or something? You just... Okay, so it's the summer of 1992. Mia's taping Woody back. And they're talking about SUNY. And the allegations becoming public. And, and she asks, like, what could you say? about these allegations and he says, you'll find out. And it seems like Woody is saying, you'll find out many times in these things. Like he's in control, you know? He, they're talking to each other. Both me and Woody throughout all this drama, they're talking to each other. And I don't know if they're, what they're trying to do, you know? But he has some kind of plan and he's not gonna let Mia in on it. I mean, this is what you hear. And you know, he's a writer and a filmmaker, right? Are we supposed to believe he's incapable of putting forth a narrative and putting a spin on this issue? You know, of course a director can control a narrative. That's kind of their job, isn't it? And so when people talk about how this thing has played out and, and really believe that, that she is just unhinged and he's saving these kids and, you know, she's a wackadoo and, you know, she's made up all this stuff. I mean, who's controlling the narrative here? Who has had the ability to control most of this narrative before this documentary? And that, that's, that's my thought on it. Mia gets Suni a job at the camp during that summer. But Suni's fired right very quickly because she stays on the phone with Woody the whole time. And, and it's like under a false name, but it turns out it's Woody and yada, yada, yada. But so Suni moves in with a friend. So she's just gone. And Mia talks about how she gets a call from the guy at the at the camp at the camp who had given her the job, and he's like, "Well, no, it's a big limo came, took her away." I mean, could you imagine, like, if that's your kid? And yes, things have gone on, and you're disappointed, but you're blaming your ex. But to know that your kid is just spirited away in a limo, and maybe she's of age to do so, but it must have just broken her heart, you know, because she still loves Suni. So Mia takes the, the photos of Suni to Woody's therapist to, in an effort, I guess, to get Woody to realize the depth of the problem, to get the therapist to realize that this is true, that she's not making it up because here's the photos that Woody took and to get him this, this problem addressed in therapy. You know what? Maybe some of these things can't be fixed in therapy. But anyway, so she brings these photos to Woody's therapist and he says, well, it's, it's not my job to moralize to my clients. So Mia, Mia thinks this is a moral issue. I think the most of the world would think this is a moral issue. Now, well, you might say, I don't think it's immoral, but it is a moral issue. I mean, that is the issue here. 
Mia takes the keys that she's given to Will Woody to her own apartment and she takes the keys back. So he's not supposed to be able to come and go. And seven-year-old Dylan, the one that Woody adopted, the, the little blonde girl, has already become standoffish to Woody. And she starts calling him by his name, Woody, instead of Daddy. And he tells her, stop doing that, call me Daddy. And she says one last time to him, Woody. You know how kids are, you know? Like you tell them, don't you do that again, then they go, Woody, you know? And so he says that he took her head. This is what Dylan tells in the documentary, and he pushes it into the hot spaghetti. And it makes her think that if she doesn't obey him, you know, doing what he says is the only way to protect myself. That was her takeaway. Think, this family's in drama. You know, Suni was in the family. Now she's not there. She's being sent to a summer camp. You know, she gets a job at, you know, a summer camp and then she goes and ends up at some friends and then she ends up at Woody's and everybody's all in a turmoil and they don't know if it's over or whatever with him as the boyfriend or husband or, you know, whatever way you want to look at it, the father figure. And so then the kids are feeling it too. And obviously Dylan was already having problems you know, in relation to him in the sense he was smothering her in her opinion and she's going to therapy and he's in therapy for his behavior and and so she starts getting calling him Woody instead of Daddy and he reacts. I mean, this is a this is a mess. Okay? This is what you don't want to do. It's August fourth, nineteen ninety two. We've had a summer of drama and it's not over yet. It's the end of the summer and they're at Frog Hollow in Connecticut and Mia's got her friend Casey there. She's known Casey since high school, and you have the nannies and the French tutor. So Casey has a nanny, and Mia has a nanny, maybe one or two, and then they have the French tutor. And they all go off to the store, leaving Moses and Dylan at Frog Hollow with, I believe, two nannies and a French tutor. Allegedly, Woody would come one time a week, even during all this stuff that's going on, to see, you know, to exercise his visitation and see Dylan and Satchel Ronan and even Moses. And so Woody arrives at Frog Hollow while they're off shopping again. So Dylan and Moses are there with the nannies. And one nanny allegedly loses sight of Dylan and asks around as to where Dylan's at. And they look around and they don't find her. Okay. So the group at this point in this day, they've looked around, they can't find Dylan. Woody's there at the house. Once Mia and Casey arrive back at the house, Dylan comes out, she runs to Mia, and she's got on a little sundress and she doesn't have any underwear on. And Mia thinks, oh, that's kind of weird when she asks one of the nannies to maybe she put some underwear on Dylan, but she makes a mental note out she doesn't have her underwear on. So the next day, Mia gets a call from Casey, and Casey tells her, you know, my babysitter had been disturbed the previous day, told me that she saw something really upsetting, that she walked into a room with... Dylan sitting there and Woody had his face in Dylan's lap and that Dylan was just staring off into space and that the nanny was really upset by that and she just had to let Mia know. So what Mia does, oh also that that she felt very uncomfortable and felt like she'd come into what it was an adult situation but then she realized oh my god it's a child so she was really upset about that and so when Mia asked Dylan well, did daddy have his, um, is your, his face in your lap? That Dylan said yes. And so Mia starts taping her, starts using the videotapes that she's using. And you're going to see the home movies are throughout this whole thing. She's always got a, got the, the home movies going. So she said that she thought, this is what Mia says, that the therapist was out of town or out of the country. So the best thing she could do at that point was to just go ahead and start taping. But I guess she didn't think she got more than she bargained for. Because like, I guess she just thought she was going to hear about the face in the lap. And then she ends up hearing about being that Dylan says she was taken upstairs to the attic. So over two days, whenever she says it, whenever Dylan started talking about it, but I think it's really she was asking who, what, when, where, why, and how, that she gets out of Dylan that allegedly Woody then took her up to the attic and at essay. You know what I'm saying? I'm not going to get into the, the specifics, but she was laying on her stomach and he allegedly fondled her. And, and so Mia took her to the doctor, as you do, right? But it was a Connecticut doctor that, that Dylan wasn't familiar with. So whenever she said, you know, can you tell the doctor what you told me? And I think he examined her and didn't notice anything. 
So keep that in mind, like whatever was done to her wasn't enough to um, leave much evidence that then Dylan wasn't comfortable and wouldn't talk. Like he said, daddy touched me on the shoulder. And then so the next day, well, I guess they got in the car and Mia said, it'd be helpful if you told the doctor what you told me. Okay. And so what Dylan did was that she, then they went back the next day and Dylan recounted the same thing as she's been saying this whole entire time, allegedly. And so the doctor, as a mandatory reporter, had to call the police. And allegedly, Mia didn't know that, like didn't understand mandatory reporting and stuff. I mean, that's what she's saying. But so a police investigation is open, both in Connecticut and in their place of residence, which was New York. So you've got all of a sudden now two different investigations that are opened on Woody for this allegation of essay. On August 13th, 1992, so think, between the 4th when this incident allegedly occurred and on, or whatever incident occurred, occurred, on August 13th, he files a lawsuit for child custody. On August 18th, 1992, Woody Allen calls a news conference at the Plaza Hotel in New York City. And he talks about the abuse, the rumors, the innuendos regarding the Connecticut State Police investigation. And he says that there were cruel untruths made with vindictive, self-serving motives. And he states that he was only guilty of falling in love with Suni. Was this presser a calculated move to smear Mia Farrow and deflect attention against the Dylan allegations? I mean, it's a valid question to ask because it worked in part. It really did work. This is where the Mia is vindictive, Mia has concocted this, and I'm in love with Suni thing becomes the narrative. And people recount that Woody had said that they'd heard Woody tell Mia that he wasn't in love with Suni, that this was just a fling. But, but it's become the narrative that he was in love with her at that time. And he's still with her now. So... Let's, let's continue. So Woody said that he feels no great moral dilemma regarding the relationship, okay, with Sunni. He, feels, he felt no great moral dilemma over it. I'm not going to say the word I wrote down here, but people cite that he was only Mia's boyfriend, right? And that he bore no relation to Sunni, right? And the fact that he saw no moral dilemma with this is stunning to me okay who dates their significant other's daughter I mean also while you're dating the significant other arguably who does not bother does not have a care about the effect this will have on the family so let's assume that that Sunni was of age let's assume that okay that makes no difference in the moral issue of the affair itself who does this to the mother of their children because, note, in the case of Dylan, argument would be the same, that she was also genetically re unrelated to him, just like Sunni. You following me? That would apply as well. He could later then go on to say, well, Dylan's no relationship to me. She's not genetically related to me. The only difference here is that he, she was obviously a father figure because he had been granted adopted father status. But in theory, if he had not adopted Dylan, in this theory of his, once she became of age, the age of Sunni, you know, she'd be up for up for the same situation if he if he wanted. He would feel. I mean, come on. And the press runs with this Woody in love. I have to say that in there, these episodes were spaced apart, and if you watch things episodically and not in a binge then you have time between the episodes. So I went on my new subscription service and I looked up all the old articles. And I was shocked by how many times he gave interviews versus how many times Mia gave interviews. She gave one to Vanity Fair and then I think she gave a follow-up one quite a bit later. He was giving interviews all over the place. He was doing pressers and news conferences from what I could see. And the press in part was running with this Woody in love stuff. Okay, you know, it's Hollywood. We do what we gotta do, right? We do what we gotta do. 
Woody Grant's interviews with Time, with Newsweek. You hear audio of Mia saying, God, let's get this out of the public domain. And he's seemingly butthurt and he's mad, essentially, I guess, because the police were investigating him. In my opinion, this is my take of listening to this. And, you know, he's all this, like, you'll find out and all this shit. And she's saying to him, like, let's get this out of the public domain. Let's quit talking about bad about each other through third parties and stuff. And he's like, well, you're going to talk to Newsweek. And she's like, I heard you were going to talk to Newsweek. And he's like, no, no. Well, he talked to Newsweek. I'm not taping you he, while he's taping her. I'm not talking to Newsweek while he's giving an article to Newsweek. Okay, who's running the narrative here? That, that's what I'm asking. So the PR machine is just turning and turning and turning. Woody goes on 60 Minutes. And he calls the whole issue, it's a non-event. It's a non-event. It's a non-event. How can this whole thing be a non-event? It's an event, okay? It's an event. So Mia's painted as the scorned woman. She's a woman scorned. Hell hath no fury as a woman scorned, right? And she did the Vanity Fair interview in November of 1992, which was the main statement that she did on this issue. And she stopped doing interviews. And she asked her friends not to speak with the press, and the entire family rallied around Mia and Dylan and not Woody. I want to I be real clear. At this point, that entire family and then all the friends, okay, all the ex-husbands, they're rallying, rallying around Mia and Dylan and not Woody. So what, who Woody had was Sunni. <laughs> Woody and Sunni. And I guess his machine. So Mia's exes, Andre Previn. Frank Sinatra. Now, mind you, Andre Previn's the adopted father of SUNY. Exactly. Was that wrong? I don't know. I don't know. They all took me aside. So Woody refused the Connecticut State's polygraph. Instead, he under, underwent a private polygraph. That That's not very interesting to police when they want a polygraph and you deny it. I mean, just saying... And Mia is, meanwhile, branded in the court of a public opinion as a woman scorned and unfit mother. Woody files for custody of Satchel Ronan, Dylan, and Moses. And the state of Connecticut state's attorney then asks the Yale New Haven Hospital to determine this question, essentially. What's the suitability of Dylan testifying for trial against her father. She's seven years old. He wanted the Yale New Haven to look into it and see if there was any impediments to Dylan's perceiving, to recalling, to relating, you know, in order to testify against her father. He's, the state's attorney said that was their purview to determine Dylan's suitability for trial at seven years old. But what happened is the Yale team proceeded to interview Dylan nine times nine times with an anatomically correct doll regarding these molestations allegations, asking her over and over again and again, the same questions with the doll and over and over. And she says that she felt like, what do they want from me? Why do they think I'm lying? Why are they asking me the same thing over and over and over? And she felt that she couldn't answer them properly as a seven year old with the repeated questioning. And the team compared her statements. The Yale New Haven team allegedly compared her statements from time to time between these nine times and found oddities and inconsistencies. Things they didn't understand. Like, for example, when asked in the attic, talking about things in the attic, Dylan talked about dead heads, heads of dead people. What she was referring to was the mannequins that Le Mia allegedly would have these wigs that you know you'd put uh, a head to keep the wig to keep it shape and dylan called those the heads of dead people so the team decided that dylan was delusional and she was a child that couldn't determine between fantasy and reality there were some things that like this that were easily explained away by adult dylan that weren't explained away so the yale new haven team also as they're taking notes for these interviews and things they destroyed all their contemporaneous notes now Anyone who knows anything about the legal um, field and, and trials and things know that notes are considered evidence. Con contemporaneous notes are considered evidence. You just don't destroy them. You don't, you don't do that. And so they did that. So that's also like things that she could have said that would support what she, she is now saying are now destroyed. They, they made a report and they decided. This is the Yale New Haven Hospital that Dylan was unreliable, she was untrustworthy, and or she had been coached by Mia Farrow, essentially. 
They also, instead of giving the information back to the person that had asked for the report, the state's attorney, they call up. Okay, so they don't give it to the police. They don't give it to the prosecutor. They call up Pharaoh and Allen to give them the findings. All right. Who, who came up with this? This is very odd to me. But right after, okay, the findings are given, Woody Allen does a presser on the steps of the hospital, pretty much crowing about how he was vindicated. I'm vindicated. And then Mia comes out and says, you know, I'm always going to stick by my children. And that's like end of statement for her. However, regardless of glowing and crowing pressers, you know, saying that you're vindicated, the Yale New Haven group was not the final arbiter of Woody's guilt. That's, that wasn't their place. Their place was to answer the question about whether Dylan would make a good witness at trial, basically. And they didn't think so. But they instead splashed it all to the parents, you know, Woody and, and uh, Mia, who then go and give pressers. They weren't the final arbiter, and that would be the purview of the state's attorney to determine whether it was probable cause, and then if it was found, then it would go to a judge or a jury. That's who would determine that, not, not, not the person that, that uh, created the report. So the state's attorney, Mako, it's, I think it's Frank Mako, I do believe, he didn't agree with the Yale New Haven findings at all. So immediately he was like, this is a runaway evaluation. What has happened here? So the New York State investigation was still ongoing. What we have been talking about was the Connecticut part of it. And the case in New York was assigned to Paul Williams, who believed Dylan and thought that there was a prima facie case against Allen, meaning everything on its face it didn't look good for Witty. It supported Dylan. He believed Dylan. He believed that there was enough to go forward against Woody Allen. So Paul Williams, okay, he's fired for insubordination, allegedly over this case. And later he gets his job back and seemingly he's still working for the same division. So he, he sued, he got his, sued the city of New York. He got his job back and allegedly then later on, the case is not pursue, pursued further in New York. So Woody was still suing Mia for child custody one week after the initial investigation for the child abuse allegations began. To me, that was a perfect diversion from all this other stuff. You go on the offensive, right? You don't be on your back foot and be defensive. You go on the offensive. So then we, the documentary plays this audio tape of Mia talking to Woody, and this is about the child custody, him going for custody, telling him, you, you know, this is a bad idea and that you know I'm not an unfit mother. You know in your heart I'm, I'm not heavily medicated, all these allegations, and that you know in your heart the children have always come first with me. And like, Woody, you know this. Like, and he's just letting her go on and on. He's not, you know when you're mad at somebody and they say something that's like, baloney you like call it right out you call it like you know you call it right out no he just let her go and go and go and go and go 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 and it was like she's telling the truth it, those tapes did not look good <laughs> did not did not ring well with me because he listens to her he hears her out and he's just he's not challenging her statements at all and then he's just like you'll have that chance to make that case you'll have the chance to make your case like he's in charge like he's in control it, it's crazy to me it really is this is like i said it's so messy it is very, very, very messy. So in the child custody case, Judge Elliot Wilk was to determine the custody and the visitation rights for Dylan, Moses, and Satchel Ronan. And in the court's testimony, it's revealed that a nanny had witnessed Alan with his head in Dylan's crotch. This comes out. And the judge later writes in his opinion it's unclear whether Mr. Allen will ever develop the insight and the judgment necessary to be able to relate to Dylan appropriately. He was not buying the narrative of Mia as the unfit mother and that there wasn't an inappropriate behavior. Seemingly enough information had come before him to make him believe that there was inappropriate behaviors going on. And the judge's decision was that Woody Allen acted in a grossly inappropriate manner towards Dylan and that there was no credible evidence that Dylan had been coached. This is in the judge's opinion. 
on June 8, 1993, the court awarded custody to Mia Farrow. And she also got attorney's fees. Many reporters also came forth, those that were there at the trial, to admit after listening to the trial testimony that they also didn't buy Woody Allen's version of events. And there may have been reporters that did, but they, we, don't, we don't see that in this documentary. 15-year-old Moses is allowed to decide um, whether he wants to see Woody Allen again because he's already 15. So the court said, well, Moses is old enough. He can decide. But Woody, uh, Mia gets custody of Dylan and Satchel Ronan. Allen appeals the court's verdict twice. So he appeals it to the next two higher courts. He loses and he ends up paying Mia, uh, Mia Farrow's attorney's fees to the tune of a million dollars. A million dollars. Also turns out that Woody Allen had allegedly been inconsistent about his account of not being in the attic that day. Allegedly at some point he had said, I don't ever go in the attic, I'm claustrophobic, da 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 da. But then allegedly there was some evidence that came out that he had been in the attic because his, I don't know if it was DNA, whatever, something was up there. So. The authorities believe that there was probable cause for an arrest warrant. This would be in the Dillon issue. However, the decision was made not to prosecute, not to press charges in order to spare the Dillon because she was found to be a fragile child, a fragile witness. So they wanted to spare her the public trial of it. So think, there's two investigations open. The Connecticut one, the New Haven, um, report spoiled that one and then whenever the state's attorney got it back he decided uh dylan is too fragile so that was dropped the new york one you had the other fellow that got fired and then whenever he finally got his job back by that time this one didn't go anywhere then you had the child custody case and it went in favor completely for mia to the point of he even had to pay her attorney's fees so that was the outcome on those three cases dropped dropped and then she won. So if you want to scream about being vindicated, not really. I, I don't know. I, being Having charges dropped or not pursued is not the, exactly the same as being vindicated, is it? If the child is really not going to be a good witness or would be too put through too much to testify. But anyway, so on September 23rd, 1994, Woody holds a presser. And he calls Mia vindictive. And he's calling the state's attorney and the police cowardly. <laughs> and he tells Dylan via the press, don't worry, the dark forces will not prevail. Talk about spinning a narrative, right? After the three lawsuits, the pharaohs moved to Frog Hollow and the family ceased discussing Woody and Sunni altogether even amongst themselves. Allegedly, Mia kept Suni's stocking or whatever. She'd hand-knitted something for Suni for six years, hoping that she'd come back, but she didn't. She went and lived with Woody. And Dylan says that she felt deep guilt regarding the grief that she brought to the family with her confession. And that none of the siblings, the older siblings that had gone through all of this, were ever the same after. And to of the adopted children that came after all this, Quincy, Farrow, um, they talk about Dylan. They, the Dylan they knew was anxiety ridden. And you've got to think back to that, those younger home movies of Dylan. She was effervescent. And then, then she became withdrawn, anxiety ridden. Dylan discusses her own mental health and how this incident affected her relationship with boys and men and how she broke up with the only boy she had in high school because she real, she feared any physical intimacy with a man, with a boy. After many years, Dylan meets her now husband online and so that's good, they have a family. So she is healing. Also note in episode four, Dylan has a visible panic attack. And so it is triggering, just FYI, if, if um, you're triggered by extreme anxiety, just note that episode four does have a panic attack. She doesn't say, oh, I'm having a panic attack. You can just see you're having a panic attack. So she is still obviously recovering from the, the trauma of what happened and trying to heal. Now, throughout these years, Woody Allen was still giving sporadic interviews. All right, 
So the family, the pharaohs are recovering at Frog Hollow. Mia's still adopting some children and they were not having anything to do with Woody and Suni. And me and the rest are now remaining silent. And at the age of 27, Suni marries Woody Allen. But it's reframed, guys. It's re well, it's framed as a love affair. An enduring love against all odds. Aww. So Satchel Ronan, he admits in this documentary that he was offered an incentive by Woody Allen that if he would go against Mia and Dylan, then his education and a comfortable lifestyle would be financed, contingent on him going against his mother and his sister. Satchel Ronan seemingly declines and he builds up being a public figure in his own right. You might know him now as Ronan Pharaoh. And we find out that he initially did not support Dylan bringing back up her abuse in public, meaning he just didn't think that she should talk about it anymore. He should, she should just get over it. He told her to leave it in the past. And in frustration, he asks her point blank, what happened to you? And then after she told him, he cried and he, he changed his tune regarding her having her say. All the adults have had their say. All the reporters had their say. People, you know, at news conferences had their say and the pressers had their say. And time and newsweek and vanity fair and and all the other people the talking heads had their say but the one person who's alleging a crime never properly had her say i guess i didn't realize she wanted to have a say and was kind of dismissed and um discounted then in January 2014, there's the Golden Globes, also the Academy Awards too. That season, they were lauding Woody Allen. They were giving him a Lifetime Achievement Award. Actors and actresses um, giving him standing ovation. And speaking about how great Woody Allen has been for women in film. And so at this point in the narrative, Ronan knows his sister's story and he's quite irked at the tongue bath Woody Allen is getting in Hollywood. So he's irked and he tweets out, did they put the part where a woman publicly confirmed he molested her at age seven before or after Annie Hall? And so then that kind of got people talking again. And I think that was the era of Time's Up and then there was the era of Me Too and Dylan proceeds to write an essay. And she worked to get the essay published. And that is shocking to me. See, I didn't know that. I put, I never knew she had to fight so hard to have a say. I, it's stunning to me that when she put forth an essay, someone didn't go, oh, I, this, is, this is absolutely worthy to be heard. It's stunning to me that people were so afraid to be sued, essentially. Because you know people love to talk about stuff like this. So why were they loath to print her essay? If it's not scandalous or wildly inaccurate, or you know, wildly verging from what they'd reported in the past, why would they be so scared to publish what she had to say? Think, Mia's had her say multiple times. Woody's had his say, I don't even know how many times. You've had reporters having their say. You've had witnesses having their say. You've had courts having their say. You've had everybody and their brother writing articles about it for decades. Sunni's had her say. And, and nobody, when Dylan finally writes an essay, is willing to publish it? I, that, that blows my mind. So finally, a New York Times columnist allows his platform for her to publish it. Even if you didn't agree with it, she should have her say. She was part of this. I, I, it's stunning to me. I'm assuming that different outlets were afraid of a lawsuit or something. So in 2018, the brother Moses, who had been supportive of both Mia and Dylan for his whole, this whole time, then came forward to say in a blog post that one, Dylan was lying, and two, that Moses had been abused himself by Mia Farrow. Okay, let's, let's take this in because you always want to hear a victim. What this documentary does is then shows a letter that, wrote, that Moses wrote at, his, at the age of 29 
and the letters shown, it was a Mother's Day card, but it was written, he wrote a nice um, missive to his mother, Mia Farrow, extolling her virtues and, and saying all kinds of nice things. Um, so you wonder, like, which is it, right? Is, is she this horrible Mommy Dearest character who abused you? Or is it how you wrote this letter and how you've stated throughout the years? So, I mean, it's fair enough that people can sometimes finally come forward with, with abuse later on. And that maybe they had, in order to protect themselves, lie to their abuser. Okay, that's fair enough. What Moses did say, though, was that Dylan was lying. And, and where I'm coming from is that, does he have the right to claim that Dylan is a liar? No, because the only Alan... Woody Allen and Dylan were there allegedly in the attic and in my opinion that's not his purview to say that whether Dylan was a liar in that instance that's not right he was trying to say that there was no train set in the attic therefore Dylan is a liar and also Mia did these things to me Mia did these things to me ha let him have his say I, I don't know I don't know what Mia did or didn't do to him. Now, you can also put forth his letter and say, well, you, you said all, that she's like the best mother ever, ever, or whatever, you know, glowing thing he wrote in this letter to her. But by that same token, that's fine. Let him have his say. But for him to then say, Dylan's a liar, there was no train set in the attic. Number one, that's really not your place to say she's a liar. And then the documentary goes and proves that the train there had been some kind of train set there because three detectives saw it and then they show document after document after document talking about the train set in the attic and then a diagram and saying here's where the train set was. So, I mean, Moses, I, I don't know what's going on, you know. So Dylan today, in the documentary, wishes that she had testified against Woody Allen, okay? She thinks that she wasn't brave. She feels that when she was young, she wasn't brave, that she had done, she should have done the right thing and testified against him. So in the fall of 2020, in the documentary, we see Dylan meeting with that prosecutor, the one that Frank S. Mako, the one that decided not to go forward with the charges. And she tells the prosecutor, Mr. Mako, that her mother had told her that she should be grateful to Mr. Mako for not going forward because it just would have destroyed her. That, that this whole machine would have destroyed her. And Mako says, you know what? Don't blame yourself. I made the decision not to go forward. You were way too fragile at the time. And I told you I would meet with you someday. And here we are. And, you know, just don't blame yourself. And Dylan pretty much says that S.A. is a lifetime sentence. That she is dealing with what happened to her. That she says rem she remembers happened. Now, if you want to believe that Mia Farrow put these thoughts in her head, that's your opinion. That's your opinion. I don't know. We weren't in that attic. All we know, all we can see is what is being presented to us. And we do what we have to do, right? We do what we have to do. So here's my takeaway. So my takeaway is I feel sorry for all those children. I feel sorry for Dylan, Suni, Moses, Satchel Ronan, all of them. And I'm glad they're now getting the opportunity to tell their side because we've heard from both Woody Allen and Mia Farrow and all the folks that were witnesses and exes and reporters and all these different people have made money off this story, right? And now we get the kids' perspective. Now Dylan gets her turn to speak. And, you know, the children, they're never to blame because they're children. And as adults, you know, perhaps as a takeaway, you know, we should analyze why society still idolizes celebrities. Like they're not fallible. Like they don't have feet of clay and do rotten things like everybody else. And just look at that. Just really reevaluate it. And, you know, in some, I do believe, Dylan. That's my stance. Okay. And I understand it's very, very messy. I also believe in my opinion, that what Woody Allen did by seducing Suni was highly immoral, that it was selfish and suspect and just uncaring of the atom bomb that detonated in the family and the fallout that resulted from, from the act. And that fallout fell and it poisoned everybody in its wake and just left everybody in a mess. And that is why incestual or incest-like relationships 
are frowned upon and they're wrong in society. This is one example of what kind of, kind of crap can go on. And if you think about it, you've got two different issues. You've got the Dylan issue and you've got the Sunni issue. All right. And one will be Ill illegal and immoral and, and one will be just immoral. Right. In theory, you would never, according to Woody's own words, ever run into the Dylan issue. If not for this, because he's saying this is only being accused of, you know, I'm only being accused of this by Mia and co because of this. Causal, causally, the thing with Dylan wouldn't have ever happened if he hadn't done the thing with Sunni. So that's one prime example of why you don't do stuff like that, right? It's just messy. And, and I think that I'm glad that the, the people are trying to heal from this. Also, if you want to get really deep and like, what do you think? I'll tell you what I think. I think that that Sunni has Woody by the balls. That's my opinion. So if you found this video to be informative, please hit the like button and hit the subscribe bell. I basically do those youtube -y things. And also feel free to leave comments in the comment section below. I wanna know, did you watch this documentary? Do you plan on watching this documentary? And what, did, what was your takeaway? Could you find a, a takeaway from this? Um, What's your favorite Woody Allen movie? That's what Dylan asks the audience very sarcastically in her essay. Yeah, I mean, can we separate the art from the artist? That's a whole entire other argument, isn't it? And it's in this documentary, it's also argued that perhaps some art is so darn great that you can get over it and you can separate the art from the artist, but we just want to wait until the artist is dead so they don't get any money from it. Oh, gosh. Anyway, I hope you have an excellent day. Take good care.